Hello and welcome one and all to a tale of two cameras, a clash of the titans, a battle of the heavyweights, or simply what happens when you pitch two very expensive and very different cameras head to head that coincidentally cost around the same price. Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs and I'm of course talking about Sony's flagship mirrorless camera, the Alpha One, versus Fujifilm's latest GFX medium format, the 100S. As Sony's gradually pushed full-frame prices higher, Fujifilm's attempted to reduce the cost of their medium format system, and now these two models have met at around the six grand point. At six and a half thousand dollars or pounds, the Alpha One is actually more expensive than the GFX 100S, which retails for six thousand dollars or five thousand five hundred pounds, but they're close enough to make for an interesting discussion of their strengths and weaknesses. Both cameras arrived for testing at the same time, allowing me to make a number of direct comparisons for photo and video quality, and that's what this video is all about. If you're interested in their respective design, controls, ports, screens, viewfinders, and all-round handling, do check out my separate reviews of each camera. For this video, I simply had the unusual opportunity to measure the image quality of two flagship cameras, and I thought it would be fun to see how they directly compare. There's no overall winner here, just two high-end cameras taking very different approaches with a similar budget. Oh, and if you have watched my first GFX 100S video, thanks by the way, you'll see some results repeated here, but in much more detail with more examples too. Plus do stick around as there's some new comparisons entirely. Let's start with pure resolving power, for which I used a standard test chart. Since both cameras could easily out-resolve it when filling their frames, I doubled the shooting distance. I used the FE 35mm 1.4G Master on the Sony, and the GF 45mm 2.8A on the Fujifilm, both sharing a similar equivalent field of view. I shot in RAW at 100 ISO and applied the same sharpening. Now let's zoom into the section of the chart used for measuring vertical resolution, and to show the difference between the two cameras, I've had to magnify them by 10 times here. Theoretically, the 100 megapixel resolution of the GFX100 in the top half should enjoy roughly 50% greater vertical resolving power than the Alpha One in the lower half, and here you can certainly see finer details from the Fujifilm in practice. But both cameras can do even better using their pixel shift modes that capture and combine up to 16 frames to increase the resolution and reduce color artifacts. So first I'll swap out the 50 megapixel Alpha 1 frame at the bottom for the 16 frame pixel shift version which Sony claims delivers up to 100 megapixels of resolution. You can see here it's brought the Alpha 1 arguably a tad beyond the GFX 100S thanks probably to the full color sampling here. But of course, it requires a tripod and a static subject. But the GFX 100S can do the same trick, so let's now swap its single frame for a 16 frame composite assembled with Fujifilm's version 1.2 software and claiming up to 400 megapixels, where it's clearly now leapfrogged the Sony pixel shift file. So much so, I've out resolved the chart again. What these tests prove is pixel shift composites can allow the low resolution Alpha 1, or indeed other models, to match the GFX 100S in pure resolving power, but only in controlled environments with a static camera and a static subject. If your subject or technique requires a single frame, the GFX 100S gives you more resolution than any camera at this price. Charts are useful, but deathly boring, so let's go outside now for a real-life comparison between the cameras, again using the same lenses. So here's a single 50 megapixel frame of Brighton Pier with the Sony Alpha 1, an FE 35mm 1.4G Master lens, and taking a closer look towards the middle shows a lot of fine detail from the combination. Now let's keep the Alpha 1 on the left, and add a crop from the same area taken by the GFX 100S and GF 45 2.8 2 on the right. Both of these are 8 times magnified views, so not quite as tightly cropped as the chart a moment ago, but still pretty tight. At this level, you can see the GFX 100S on the right resolving finer details, most noticeably, for me anyway, on the light bulbs running over the domed roof. The diagonal supports also look more jagged on the left. Moving sideways to a different area, and you'll notice the difference in the railings on the pier, as well as the writing on the coffee and ice cream shop. Meanwhile, in the background, you'll see finer details on the chimneys in the skyline. I'd say that while you're technically only looking at a 50% increase in linear resolution from the GFX 100S for single frames, it is translating into visibly finer details, at least at this degree of magnification. Whether you need it, though, is another matter. I'm only here to show you the difference. But once again, the pixel shift mode on the Alpha 1 allows it to generate a 100 megapixel image, so let's swap out the single frame from the Sony on the left, and replace it with a 16 frame composite. 
Now in the static areas, there's definitely a little more detail, but to me, it's not looking as natural now as the single frame from the GFX 100S on the right. But the biggest issue, of course, are those strange looking hashed areas where something's moved between the frames, be it a person, a bird, a vehicle, or even a cloud in the sky. Now let's swap the GFX 100S image on the right from the single frame to its 16 frame composite where the overall image now looks soft with my default processing settings. I wanted to keep them same for consistency here. So more sharpening and contrast can certainly help and it's easily added to the DNG file that's generated by the Fujifilm software. But if you look really closely, I'd say there is a small boost in detail here. But again, the result is ruined by anything that moved during the capture process. Again, proving that pixel shift may yield very definite benefits in controlled environments with static subjects, but just aren't suitable for this kind of thing. So if you need high resolution on a single frame for real life subjects, megapixels count. Next for a noise test where I photograph these flowers in JPEG and RAW at every ISO sensitivity using each camera, again fitted with those 35mm equivalent lenses. I'm going to show you a crop from each image made at 9 times magnification, starting with out of camera JPEGs, before then comparing processed RAW files. So first on the left you're looking at crops from the Alpha 1 JPEGs, and on the right crops from the GFX 100S JPEGs, all out of camera showing the kind of quality you can expect if you're not into processing RAW files. Now when viewed at the same magnification here, the GFX 100S is a little cleaner and more detailed right out of the gate, even at 100 ISO, and it maintains this advantage throughout the range, even up to 12,800 ISO, which is where I'll stop here and start again with the RAW files. Ok, so now you're looking at the 100 to 12,800 ISO sequence using RAW files, processed with high sharpening and zero noise reduction to deliberately reveal any artifacts. So you're going to see those noise speckles much sooner than normal and it is going to get ugly at the higher numbers too. When viewed at the same magnification, the GFX 100S pixels appear smaller, which in turn means the grain from noise looks finer too. And by 1600 to 3200 ISO, the difference between the two cameras becomes clear. Now don't get me wrong, there's still a lot of detail in the Alpha 1 images, but you'll need to process with noise reduction carefully to get the best from them. So the physically larger sensor of the GFX 100S has delivered cleaner results even with its higher pixel count. Before moving on, back to the 100 ISO raw crops of each image because this is a perfect subject to demonstrate their pixel shift modes. So here's the single image versions, and now I'll swap the alpha 1 single frame on the left for a 16 frame pixel shift version, which is not only an improvement over the single frame alpha 1 image, but also the single frame from the GFX 100S on the right. Some of this is of course due to the higher colour resolution achieved in the pixel shift process. So now let's swap the GFX 100S crop on the right for its own 16 frame pixel shift version. Like my previous example, the result looks a little bit soft here, but it can be adjusted to taste as Fujifilm's pixel shift process delivers a DNG RAW file for further processing. Note I used version 1.2 of the software and I processed the DNG files here using my default settings for consistency across the tests. Ok, as a brief respite from all these detailed crops, let's have a quick look at the potential for bokeh with these two 35mm equivalent lenses from the same distance, starting with the Alpha 1 and 35mm 1.4G Master at 1.4, and now the GFX 100S with the GF45 2.8 at 2.8. Note the square of 4 by 3 aspect ratio of the GFX, so for all my comparisons in this video I've attempted to match the vertical height of each frame. Placing an enlarged crop from both images side by side with the Alpha 1 on the left and the GFX 100S on the right shows that actually delivering quite similar results here. The blobs are slightly larger from the Sony combination on the left, but they're still respectable from the Fujifilm combination on the right. Both share similar rendering styles too with clean blobs and minimal outlining. Note that the Sony lens can focus closer though, allowing even bigger blobs and like other recent G-Master lenses it maintains excellent sharpness at close range. Plus if you are into obliterating the background using a shallow depth of field there are more lens options available for the full frame alpha system than there are for the GFX medium format system. Now while I've concentrated on image quality in this particular video I did film a quick single autofocus comparison for still photos with each body again fitted with those same lenses from the same distance starting here with the alpha 1 and 35mm 1.4G master which as you can see is pretty quick and confident. 
And now for the GFX 100S and GF45 2.8, where there may be a minor wobble at times to confirm the focus at each end, but the overall speed is faster than you might expect for a medium format system. Now when it comes to continuous autofocus and burst shooting, the Sony Alpha 1 is simply a world apart and better in fact than literally any other camera right now. But if you're single focusing on static subjects, both models are actually fairly matched. Even in leisurely focus pulls during video though, the confidence of Sony's continuous autofocus system is quite apparent. There's no problems at all here. Just compare it to Fujifilm's continuous autofocus for video, and while it does successfully land on the subjects, the journey isn't anywhere near as smooth and confident, with regular pauses and hesitation. This extends to continuous autofocus during video for moving subjects. Here's the Alpha 1 and the 50mm 1.2 G Master, seemingly oblivious to the challenge of finding and keeping a face perfectly focused at f1.2. And now for the GFX 100S fitted with the 80mm 1.7, showing how it finds the task much harder. Note that these are not matching lenses and I did film them at different times, but they do represent standardish coverage with large apertures. Moving on to movie resolution, here's the Alpha 1 filming Brighton Pier with the 35 1.4G Master in its best quality 8K resolution. So now this time the Sony has the advantage over the Fujifilm. Here's an enlarged view with the Alpha 1 at the top and the GFX 100S at the bottom, with the Fujifilm fitted again with the GF 45mm and recording in its best quality 4K mode. Now differences in lenses, sensor sizes and just simply the way that each camera generates video frames meant that the GFX 100S in this particular example was actually capturing a slightly tighter field of view with this lens and body combination, giving it a small advantage when comparing 4K files for this particular scene, but the 8K on the Alpha 1 more than compensates with visibly more detail recorded. That said, considering the line skipping, the GFX 100S 4K video isn't bad at all. And that's all the direct comparisons I had time to make between my other reviews before the cameras were returned. As I explained at the start, there's no winner here as they're aimed at different people capturing different kinds of subjects. In terms of high resolution photos, a stronger and fairer rival for the GFX 100S in the full frame world would be Sony's A7R Mark IV, while for high resolution video the only rival right now for the Alpha 1 is the Canon EOS R5. But again, this video was all about taking a rare opportunity to make some photo and movie comparisons between two high-end cameras that coincidentally share similar pricing and happen to arrive for testing at the same time. I couldn't resist doing it and found the results did actually provide some useful background and context into where each company is focused. Plus it was a bit of fun and I hope you enjoyed watching it too. If you're interested in either camera, please do check out my full reviews of each model as they go into way more specific details. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.